Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Molly's Salon. This is a weekly half hour salon featuring artists, leading thinkers, and creative firebrands. My name is Sima Sueko, and I serve as the Deputy Artistic Director of Arena Stage. And this evening, I am Molly's understudy, as she is on a well-deserved vacation. We have three remarkable guests joining us this evening, Travis Lamont Ballinger, Soraya Shimali, and Don Ursula. First up is Travis. Travis Lamont Ballinger is a generative artist. As a producer, he has developed and produced work with a number of artists, including Katori Hall, Lynn Nottage, Whitney White, Lydia Diamond, and Gordon Greenberg. He most previously worked as the Associate Artistic Director at the Old Globe, and before that, he held positions with the Drama League, Dallas Theater Center, Market Road Films, and Arena Stage. And he's currently a producer at Leah Volick Productions. Welcome, Travis. It's so great to see you. Hi, it's so great to see you. And you are in New York City right now, is that correct? I am. I just got back to New York two weeks ago. So yeah, oh. I'm in New York now. Excellent. Well, welcome back and welcome to Molly's Salon. Um, I wonder if we could first start with you telling us about this production company, Leah Volick, that you've moved to. Sounds like a wonderful organization. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Leah Volick Productions is uh, a new company helmed by Leah Volick, of course. Um, she's the lead producer on the Michael Jackson musical uh, coming next spring and uh, Almost Famous, uh, which just premiered at the Old Globe in San Diego, amongst other things. Uh, it's, it, it's an incredible commercial company that has this kind of mission to produce uh, diverse work and uh, to kind of push the boundaries of, of what we see on, 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 on Broadway. Excellent. And this seems very timely right now um, as we are experiencing uh, maybe a rebirth, a renaissance mm -hmm. of the Black Lives Matter movement and mm -hmm. uh, a real illumination in this time that we're living in around um, the racism of theater and of our yeah. industry. Uh, could you talk a little bit, this is a question I didn't tell you I was gonna ask you, but talk a little bit about, about that and maybe how, how this company might be navigating those waters. Right, I mean, I think first and foremost, it is, uh, Leah asked me to join her and to partner with her um, because she believed in me, she believes in me as a producer. Um, but it is true to say that this is one of the only companies that has a producer of color on its rosters. Um, I think that we are all reading the books. We're all reading the literature. In fact, it's sold out on Amazon and in every bookstore. We're mm -hmm. all trying to think about how to infuse anti-racism practices into our daily lives. But I think that uh, it is possible to get stuck in just learning the literature without actually moving into the place of practicing. And so I'm happy that Leah is practicing uh, and hiring me. And I, I, I don't wanna be so, I, I hate to be so blunt, but you know, that's one of the first steps uh, is just to give the jobs to provide the opportunities um, for artists of color to advance. Um, there is an awakening happening in theater. And I think that what we will see on the other side is going to be better than most of us could possibly imagine. That's fantastic. And Travis, you know, you are uh, one of the leading producers in the nation. Uh, your resume just shows us that with working at the Old Globe, uh, the Drama League, and of course, the three years you spent at Arena Stage. We're so lucky that you uh, shared your time and talents and artistry with Arena. Could you talk about the work that you did at Arena Stage? Absolutely, absolutely. Arena was like grad school for me because I didn't go to grad school. Like I said, and it's um, it's like uh, Edgar and Molly and at the time David Dower uh, took me and Ronnie and Amritha, uh, who were my colleagues in this program that we were in in the uh, new 
New Play Institute, which is now HowlRound. Um, they took us under their wings and they taught us uh, nothing was off limits uh, in, in our learning about producing from idea to third production because Molly's notion that a play is still new up until through the third production. Um, the work we line produced shows, we did workshops and readings, we worked with community organizers and activists to bring uh, additional material to the audiences. Uh, it was, it, it, I've, I don't know if I've had many more opportunities for that kind of intellectual stimulation and that kind of rigor. Um, uh, three years, it was just so special. That is so fantastic. Um, what if you were to think of one of the projects you worked at at the Old Globe that really was meaningful for you? Which one would, or excuse me, at Arena Stage? Which one would that have been? I uh, I would say, okay, so this was a really kind of small thing, or it wasn't small; it was part of a bigger. But um, uh, the Laramie Project ten years later, uh, David just kind of handed it to me and said, "Run with it," and. Uh, we filled the Lincoln Theater on U Street to the brim. I mean, people were standing in the back in that 1200 seat theater. And it was just, and the conversation that was happening across the country on that night when all of the theaters were doing it together. Um, and uh, it was just so, so incredibly special. Well, that, and then the, the Buckminster Fuller show that we did there that uh, D.W. Jacobs wrote and directed. I now have a tattoo of a geodesic dome because that show so fully changed my life. Working <laughs> on that baby as, my, as the co, it, it was a life-changing experience. Oh, that is fantastic. Uh, talk to me a little bit as you look ahead to the future. Um, what are you striving for right now? I am striving for a world where I can enter into theatrical spaces and see more people who look like me. Um, I'm striving for that. I think that we are on, like I said, I think we're on the precipice of something really grand. And I think that if we can just get through what feels, what may feel bad, what may feel dangerous and scary, but if we can just push through that collectively on the other side of that is something so profoundly beautiful that I can't even explain it. Um, I, and, and I'm striving for that, um, for whatever that, for what, for whatever that other side is and to be able to enter into these spaces with people who look like me. How are you um, making that happen? I think that I th it is my mission to create space and opportunity for artists of color, for BIPOC artists. It is my mission. Um, it is my mission to create space for gender non-conforming uh, trans artists uh, and to give them light and to give them attention. Uh, and I will do that in every small and large way I can. That's great. What do you think the obstacles are to that? And how can our viewers help you? I think that there is um, a, a fear that uh, with when we start talking about some of these ideas, some of these, especially anti-racism, and uh, when we start talking about it, I think that we hear the word racism and everyone gets afraid. Um, and I think that what we can all do is take a breath, realize that we have inherited over hundreds of years some ideas that we are more than capable of unlearning and with that renewed energy, go forward and make change. I think that the people listening and watching pick up the paper, find the name of an artist that you do not know, get to know their work, invest in their work, uh, find out more about them, stalk them on social media, <laughs> do everything you can to just find a new artist, make a habit of doing it once a month. Uh, because I assure you that when uh, Tennessee Williams and Arthur Miller were writing their masterpieces, there were other people writing masterpieces. And the 
artists that we have writing masterpieces now are a diverse cadre of people and they all deserve your attention. That is beautiful, Travis. Thank you, Thank you so very much for, for joining us. What a joy to see you. Congratulations on your new position. Give our best to everybody at your production company. And for all our viewers, uh, let's all support Travis in his work at Leah Volick Productions. Have a great evening, Travis. Thank Goodbye. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Our next guest is Soraya Shimali. Soraya is an award-winning writer and media critic. She speaks frequently on topics related to inclusivity, free speech, sexualized violence, data, and technology. She is the former director of the Women's Media Center Speech Project, which was an initiative dedicated to expanding women's civic and political participation. And she is the incoming executive director of the Representation Project. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Um, Soraya, thanks so much for, for joining us this evening. Oh, I'm delighted. Thank you, Seema. You wrote a book called Rage Becomes Her. Uh, and I just ordered this, this book and started reading it. I love it. Could you tell our viewers a little bit about the book? Sure. Um, it's about the social construction of anger and how we learn to think about it, how we learn to think about our own feelings, uh, and what the political uses of anger are in a society. Uh, specifically, it's really about why we choose to distribute the right to be angry as an entitlement, right? Why we deny certain people the right to be angry, but we are deeply respectful of other people's right to be angry. And um, so it goes from the, uh, very intimate and personal realm of interpersonal relationships and identity through relationships, the workplace, and then the political sphere. Who has the right to be angry? <laughs> what are you seeing in society? You know, I, I wrote the book specifically in response to the 2016 elections because, I mean, I've written about these topics for many years now, but what was so striking about that election was that certain politicians could leverage populist anger and they were male, they were men. Uh, and, and so whether it was Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump, they could stand at a podium and they could look a little unhinged and red in the face and they could you know, slam, slam the stage, the, the, the podium on the stage, but women candidates couldn't do that. And so someone like Hillary Clinton had to stay extremely con constrained and uh, very calm looking and then was called uh, inauthentic. At the same time, in the general population, it was clear that anger as expressed by different people in the society got, had different uptake in media. Uh, so white, men, white male anger historically has been a marker of citizenship an expression of rights. But if black men act in the same ways, they're criminalized. And if black women approach the same sort of behaviors, they're also seen as threats. And um, so it, it's not just a matter of gender, but it's racialized and, and there are ethnic aspects to it as well. Can you talk about social location, uh, this, this term? Sure. I mean, I, I think that, you know, we live in a hierarchical society. We have these relationships. We are in a very uh, diverse, but not particularly inclusive country. And we all have social locations. And th the thing about it is our social locations change with context, right? In some places, a person might have relatively high status and feel like they have egalitarian relationships, but then they go into a new context and all of that shifts. Um, but when you look at the, the, the institutions in our country, whether they're in entertainment or in politics or in education, we still, it's very evident, have um, almost all male rule and almost all white male rule. And so somewhere between 75 and 90 percent of the majority, you know, of Congress, of tenured professors, of corporate executives, of uh, media owners, which it's even higher for media owners, it's more like 97 or 
are all, all of that power and resource and authority and legitimacy and influence is very concentrated in people in that social location. Um, and I think people struggle because, you know, when, when you say the words white male supremacy, people recoil, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and part of the process we're going through right now and have been going through for years is normalizing some of these ideas through the use of language. Mm -hmm. Do you see that getting normalized? Uh, I don't know that it's getting normalized, but I know that seven or eight years ago, if I wrote, I didn't even have to write white male supremacy. If I wrote male supremacy or white supremacy, you know, put those two together, that's even more complicated. Those words were taken out by editors. And I mean, editors at national publications, uh, you know, people who, frankly, I, I felt really should have known better. Um, but those words were taken out and those words are no longer taken out. I would say that, you know, one of the results of, of Trump's election and the very clear um, hatred and animus and uh, protest to the, the sort of backlash to having a black president, um, that makes words like white supremacy uh, seem more legitimate to people who were willing to dismiss it before. I see. Now, you're about to begin a position at the Representation Project. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what, what the Representation Project is? Oh, I would be delighted to. Um, well, so first of all, the Representation Project was started by uh, Jennifer Siebel Newsom, who made a film about 10 years ago called a misrepresentation and it was really focused on the relationship between the sexualization of women in american media and the the lack of public faith and trust in women as leaders and uh, this film really said and did things that illuminated the 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 cultural misogyny that we sort of had all gotten used to. You know, there was a period of feminist liberation and feminist activism and the movement for civil rights. And then we went into a period of backlash. And somewhere between 1990 and 2010, we just slid back into some incredibly damaging and retrograde stereotypes in our media and in our language. And this film honed in on uh, gender and also the intersection of gender with race for women of color and black women honed in on the relationships between how people portray us, perceive us, and um, choose to trust or not trust us with power. So that was the starting point. And um, out of that, out of the public response to that film, which was very positive, she started the representation project. So today we make films, but we also have a, a youth media academy that uh, educates and trains young people, teenagers, to make films, documentary films. Uh, this year, 60, over 60 kids, uh, they won more than 20 awards. Uh, so we're very excited to be able to engage in that sort of transformative storytelling. Congratulations on that new position. That sounds oh, very excited. exciting. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Soraya, I wonder if you could share what you're striving for now. <laughs> At this exact moment. Yes. <laughs> Um, well, I'm, I'm actually genuinely glad to have, this is like a moment of peace in my day, which is quite lovely um, to just be able to sit and have a conversation like this. I'm actually really striving uh, to think about how we have these very difficult conversations mm -hmm. about all of these issues that we know exist, all of the failures, the institutional failures in our society, um, and how we come to truth and reconciliation. And I do mean that on virtually every level. Like we can't really have difficult public conversations until we practice at home, until we practice with our intimates, with people we trust. It's extremely hard to talk about some of these issues. It's extremely hard to talk about inequality and uh, misogyny and racism and class differences and poverty. I mean, all, all of these things are all wrapped up together. And, um, I think the tendency has been to gloss over them, to ignore them, to minimize them, to disparage people who were raising their hands and, and you know, waving flags and trying to cause attention. And we can't really afford to do that anymore. We're, we have, we're facing so many simultaneous crises 
uh, that we can't. We just have to be able to have these discussions and move forward. So my own uh, challenge is to think about the language involved, the interpersonal relationships, um, and being able to, to get people to think in terms of the impact that their personal actions can have on institutional change. We tend to think in legalistic terms. If we pass that law, then of course we'll solve the problems of equality in the workplace, which we know is not the case. So why do we keep pretending that, that that's going to work, right? Wow. Well, uh, if you figure all that out, will you write a book that I can read <laughs> and learn everything I, I need to know? Um, Soraya, thank you so much for joining us on the salon. It's such a joy to see you again. Oh, thank uh, and you so much. Thank you and best wishes with the new position. Thanks, Take care, Jen Soraya. Zima. Have a good night. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Our final guest this evening is Dawn Ursula. Now, all of us who live in the DC region are so lucky that Dawn calls this place home and shares her deep well of talents with us. She's appeared on stages across our region and across the nation, uh, including Everyman Theater, where she's also a member of the board, Woolly Mammoth, Roundhouse, Arena Stage, uh, ACT in San Francisco, and others. And she was last seen at Arena Stage in A Raisin in the Sun. And we are very excited that we'll be able to welcome her back at Arena Stage uh, next year in the title role of Tony Stone. So welcome Dawn Ursula. Hi Dawn, how are you? Oh, I, there you are. Hi, uh, yes, here I am. <laughs> Hi. Hi, it's so great to see you again. Um, Dawn, I'm so excited because you are one of our top sellers on the Arena Stage Theater Artists Marketplace. And I wonder if you could tell our viewers about the marketplace and talk about your experience on that. Oh, absolutely. The marketplace is such a fantastic um, idea. And thank you, Seema, because you did not mention it's your brainchild. So we are all <laughs> so appreciative. I set you up for that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, I, and I'm, I'm so excited and hoping that, that other arts organizations or theaters or even groups of artists can think about this as a model, you know, um, where artists who are out of work, um, we want to create, we want to make income and, and we want to express ourselves and many of us have these other talents or crafts or abilities and this marketplace that you all are providing for us is this fantastic platform for the patrons um, and theater lovers and community goers to come and buy works of art or gifts, classes. I just recently went to the marketplace to see who else was new there. It's so much exciting stuff. You can buy masks, you can get pictures di digitally put, you know, on digital format. You can, <laughs> you can get concerts, you can, it's, it's endless and it's, and it's such a wonderful thing for us, the artists, to be able to, um, to create and make money. And it's, yeah, it's a great model. Well, uh, since you didn't talk about yourself, I'm going to tell everybody <laughs> um, on the marketplace, uh, Dawn is offering uplifting messages where you can, let's say there's somebody you want to thank, you want to just send love to, uh, you let Dawn know who it is, what this occasion might be, or what it is you want to convey, and she'll create a video message. Uh, for you to be able to share with them. And I've now purchased several of them and <laughs> they um, are indeed uplifting and bring joy and laughter and, and tears to, to some folks. So um, thank you for sharing that, Dawn. I think it's been a great treat for me too, making them. It, it was, I didn't expect that part of it, but it's really been lovely. Oh, that's great. Now, we've tried to keep you as busy as we can at Arena Stage, and you were featured in the docudrama film that we made called May 22, 2020, and you were so excellent in it. And you've done film and TV before. You did The Wire, you did Veep, um, but this was a little uh, bit of an unusual project, and here we were working on it in the pandemic. Could you talk a little bit about your experience working on it? Yeah, it was great. It was really a great experience. And I have to tell you, um, 
you know, being an artist that works in both theater and on camera, I, I was a little skeptical seeing, I was like, can the theater people pull off doing some film work? I'm not sure here. You guys are awesome. You were like, I, you know, you ever, you know, heard the, of the phrase, hurry up and wait. You guys were like, you were on time. You had it rolling. And, and, and it was also um, just the material to be able to speak um, this, this, this so eloquently with the playwrights that you you had come in, um, these stories from actual people that were you know experiencing the pandemic and the wide variety. It was just it was um, a wonderful lens to be connected with our our greater community and yeah it was it was wonderful. And the all the the monologues that we had the actors do were all based on interviews. And those interviews took place on May 22, 2020, which happened to be three days before George Floyd was murdered. And then the world changed again. And I remember when you and I were rehearsing, uh, we both felt extremely heavy as we were rehearsing over Zoom. And um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you feel in this moment right now as we are, um, navigating our way toward uh, through this these entwined viruses of coronavirus and racism yeah um there's still a heaviness there is absolutely but i think the heaviness um has this kind of glimmer of hopefulness around it now that perhaps didn't happen on that day that that we talked mm -hmm. um i am i'm so encouraged by the tenacity of the protesters who were still in the streets, who are still um, screaming for justice. And, and I am so encouraged by just the indiv individual people in my community, um, in, my, in, in my artistic community, uh, who have never spoken so specifically about anti-racism and have come forward to talk to me about it and to tell me their journey and who are on that journey. Um, and I'm, I'm just, yeah, so it's, it's interesting to be in that place. It's, it's a roller coaster ride, but I'm, I'm more focused on being able to see the light, I think. That is great. <laughs> yeah, this question might be related, but what is, what's bringing you joy right now? Mm. Uh, my daughter it brings me such joy, and we decided to finally get a dog, so we have a six-month puppy. Excellent. <laughs> finally, we're like, well, we finally are home. Let's finally do it, and she brings me a lot of joy as well. Um, yeah. And that is absolutely wonderful. And you know, you can get a pet portrait made by scenic designer Paige Hathaway on the Theater Artist Marketplace. Shameless plug going on yes, right here. <laughs> Excellent. Um, what are you striving for right now? And how can our viewers help? Um, I am striving for justice. I, I said that word before. I'm, so, I'm striving for justice and I'm striving for peace. And the two are so connected. And there can't be there can't be peace without feeling a sense of justice. And I want to be able to someday tell my daughter that the murderers of Breonna Taylor were arrested. Mm -hmm. That um, the transgender community, black transgender people, are not in danger, and that their murderers are caught. And and that we can walk out of our door and say very specifically, no, I don't live in PG County. I live on Piscataway land. That we have, we're all connected. And and I think our viewers, if feel passionate, call your local officials, vote, continue to learn, ask where the children are who were separated from their parents at the border, um, and take that just one thing a month. Make a call send an email, get the justice so we can have the peace. Words of wisdom from Dawn Ursula. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Thank you so very much for inspiring us and motivating us, not just through your amazing artistry, but through your humanity and your deep well of compassion. Thank you, Dawn. So Thank great you. to see you this evening. So have a good one and lots of love to your family. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. 
Our next guests, or excuse me, our guests next week are three incredible stage directors. Sheldon Epps, who conceived and directed the highly acclaimed musicals Play On and Blues in the Night, both of which received Tony Award nominations on Broadway. And he's also my former boss at Pasadena Playhouse. He'll be joined with Ruben Santiago Hudson, another brilliant director. Uh, arena audiences saw his potent Broadway production of Jitney last season. And director Leah C. Gardner will also join them. She's an Obie award-winning director who's directed across the US and internationally, and she is incredibly talented. All three of them are inspiring, visionary, and I hope you'll join us. Now, as we exit, we have a video to share with you about the Arena Stage Theater Artists Marketplace. Take it away, Brianne and Renee, and good night and aloha. Arena Stage's Theater Artist Marketplace gives the public the opportunity to commission or purchase a work of art safely with no in-person contact from the artists and the artisans who have graced Arena's stages. The pandemic disrupted the ability for artists and theaters to earn income, but when you make a purchase through the marketplace, you're generating much needed financial support for artists right now and a percentage supports Arena Stage. On the marketplace, you will find uplifting messages by Don Ursula, cotton masks by Deborah Nash. Kate Baldwin and Nicholas Rodriguez are offering personalized greetings, voice lessons, private virtual concerts, and meet and greets. You can get hand-done original drawings by Ken McDonald, public speaking lessons by Lisa Nathans or Zach Campion, original music compositions by Victor Simonson, beautiful rock garden designs by David Leong. Timothy Thompson will convert your analog videos and photos to digital. You can get cooking lessons with singing from Kirsten Wyatt, a virtual writing salon for you and your friends by Mary Hall Surface, scenic model pieces by Paige Hathaway, and you can even get one-on-one -on -one coaching with four-time Academy Award nominee, Marsha Mason.